Hey there, this video is gonna be a deep dive comparison between the Sony FX3 and the Canon R5C. Now these are both very popular and very capable cameras, and this was a heavily requested video. Now I made a comparison video between the A7S3 and the R5C last year, but there have been a lot of R5C updates in the last year, including the 1.0.3.1 firmware update, which a lot of us call the Netflix firmware. Now in that it quote, improves the image quality of Canon Log3 when shooting in XFAVC or MP4 formats. Now, there haven't really been many reviews and test videos with the R5C since it's now an older camera because it came out in early 2022, and at the time of recording this, it's late 2023. So let me give you a little bit of a backstory about my experience with the R5C. Now, I had the R5C when it came out last year. I used it a lot, I made a bunch of videos about it, and I actually didn't have it for an extended period of time. And since I picked one up somewhat recently, I made a video about that. And I will reference a lot of videos in this video. I'll leave a section down below with related videos. Uh, the more I use and learn about the R5C and the intricacies, the more interesting this camera is becoming to me. I also feel like the R5C is a little bit of a misunderstood camera, but I think that'll be for another video. Now, I personally use the FX3 a lot. I use this pretty much exclusively for all my client work in 2023. I've owned either the A7S3 or the FX3 since it since they were launched. I rely on this camera heavily and I have a lot of experience with it. And so sometimes when I decide to make these comparison videos, it's based on what all of you want, but sometimes personally, I wanna take a deep dive and see where the technical differences are between these two cameras and sort of their capability. So I figured it'd be a good time to make a new comparison. And as opposed to last time when I used the A7S3, use the very popular FX3 against the R5C. First off, let's talk about image quality. And when I do these comparisons, I use the same lens on both cameras. I know people always ask me, but I, I always do that to eliminate that variable. So I use my Sigma Art 28 millimeter F1.4 EF lens. And to do that, I use the proper adapters. I have the Canon EF to RF adapter, and I also have the Sigma MC11. And I was using manual focus for most of this anyways. Now, there are so many different ways to compare these cameras. And I'm sure all of you watching this probably have different things you want me to compare, but I had to pick something. So let me explain what I chose and why I chose it. So I chose the highest possible recording quality I could in the FX3 internally, which is the DCI 4K X AVC SI in C Log3, and the R5C, the DCI 4K XF AVC All I in C Log3. So a lot of you might be wondering, what about RAW? Because the R5C can shoot internal RAW. Now, I made a video comparing the R5C 8K RAW with the 4K XF AVC last year, and I'll leave that video linked down below. Now, I know, like I said earlier, there's been a lot of updates to the XF AVC in the R5C, and if you're curious, maybe I can make a comparison video about the 8K RAW on this camera. Let me know in the comments down below. But here's a quick comparison with the 8K RAW with the versus the 4K XF AVC for a quick dynamic range test. There isn't a whole lot of difference. I think they're they're a lot closer than maybe they were before. But for this comparison here, I'm just gonna compare the compressed codex in the cameras because I think that's a little bit more fair. Now, like I said, the R5C can obviously shoot raw internal. The FX3 can shoot external raw in terms of ProRes raw with like a Ninja V. I made a couple videos about that. And I could potentially do a raw versus raw. So let me know if you're interested in that down below as well. Oh, do you want to mention one other thing before we look at the examples? I know there's a lot to talk about. The R5C, you can, can act, you can actually control the noise reduction in the camera, which is really cool because the FX3, you cannot control the noise reduction. Now for these tests, the R5C noise reduction was set to default, which is actually the auto setting. I made a video comparing the different settings and the noise reduction on the R5C. So if you want to check that out, again, link down below. So for all these tests, I graded them by hand. I adjusted the contrast and saturation to make the two images match as close as possible, but I didn't adjust the colors whatsoever and both were set at the sunny white balance setting. Now, one thing to keep in mind between these two cameras is the resolution. So in their 4K modes, the R5C is oversampling from 8.2K and the FX3 is oversampling from 4.2K. So these two cameras, I think both produce really nice images and a lot of detail. And the one big difference I wanna mention here is about the dynamic range. Now, I think the dynamic range is pretty similar, but the big difference being the highlights from these real world examples. You can see this in the brighter areas in the back of these two images. Also in this image, if you look at the bright spots on the ground and the leaves, I think the R5C has nicer highlight roll off. And you can also see this here with the bark on the tree and also the house in the background. 
I just think they're a little bit softer. There's a little bit more information, just nicer roll off. Uh, and, you know, I think the RFSC performs better in the highlights. And we'll look at this more in depth. Lastly, take a look at skin tones. I think they both produce nice images. One thing I noticed right off the bat here is a little bit difference in colors, which you can definitely see on my sweatshirt. So I was definitely a little bit surprised about the dynamic range, but we'll get into that more later on in this video. So let's do some pixel peeping to see about image quality here. Uh, both of these at ISO 800, they both look very similar in terms of noise, but the R5C is a little bit sharper, and that definitely comes from the 8.2K oversampled 4K versus the 4.2K oversampled 4K. So let's talk about colors for a second. Now, I know that when you're talking about color science, it's pretty subjective, and people have their personal opinions and preferences about Canon and Sony color sciences, but I would like to look at this a little bit more objectively when I can. I've been doing this in recent videos, and I really like this. So looking at the color charts here and the vector scope, we can take a look at these colors a little bit more analytically. So we have the FX3 on the left, we have the R5C on the right, and what I tried to do getting this ready is with the color charts, try to get their saturation as close as possible. And you can see that the cyan, the blue, the magenta, and the red are pretty similar on the color charts. You can also see that on the vector scope, they're pretty much ending at the same spot. So those are very similar. So let me just hide the, the titles really quickly here. So these, what you're seeing here are both the FX3 and the R5C laid on top of each other. So if I toggle off the FX3, you're just looking at the R5C. So you can see the red is a little bit more saturated than the other colors and it's shifted over a little bit towards yellow. Now, if I in bring in the FX3 footage, you can see that the FX3 definitely pulls towards yellow and green in terms of the saturation of those two colors. And you can see the green is shifted over towards yellow. And there's also a change in the skin tone. So this is the skin tone line. These are the skin tones here. So if I toggle the FX3 off, you can see that as I toggle it on and off, you can see that there's a shift towards yellow and green. So just a little bit of difference in the colors. That was interesting to share that with you. Next, talk about low light. And there's some interesting results here if you're not familiar with the performance of the R5C. Now, both of these cameras have dual base ISOs, the R5C being 800 and 3200, the FX3 being 800 and 12,800. Now, you can see this on the R5C cleaning up going from 2500 to 3200, where the R5C is cleaner all the way up to the second base ISO of 12,800 when the FX3 becomes cleaner than the R5C. I've always been impressed with the middle ISO range of the R5C and even the higher ISOs of the R5C. I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that it's oversampled from 8.2K. Whenever you have an oversampled image, it compresses the noise and makes it look a little bit cleaner. Now, I've personally found the second base ISO of 3200 on the R5C to be way more usable and versatile than the much higher second base ISO of 12,800 on the FX3. I find myself needing the ISO range in the middle a lot more than I need it at the super high end, but it depends on your use case. So the FX3 gets pretty noisy in that middle area where the R5C, in my opinion, is just performs really well all the way up to when the FX3 starts beating at 12,800. So if you're in the middle range a lot, the R5C I think is more usable, but if you need that super high ISO performance, that's where the FX3 is gonna shine. Next, let's talk about the dynamic range, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. So as I mentioned earlier on, when we were looking at the image quality examples, that the dynamic range looked pretty similar between the two, two cameras, which was actually pretty surprising to me but I like the highlight performance better on the R5C. So let's dive in here. So I like to record two different examples. And when I do these, I expose for the highlights. So I bring up the camera's exposure as high as I can without clipping the highlights, and then take a look and see what's going on in the shadows. So the first example is an outdoor example where I'm sitting in the shade and I got the really bright background behind me. I think they actually look very similar here, uh, but I definitely see a difference in the colors, which is kind of what you expect with two different sensors. The next test is a little bit more stressful. I stand in a dark room next to a bright window and taking a look at this one, if you look at the highlights, specifically like the railing that's outside through the window, it definitely looks better on the R5C, but you get way cleaner shadows on the FX3. So there's a big difference here with the highlights, but especially with the shadows. Now coming right out of the camera, the FX3 is flatter because of course recording S-Log3 versus C-Log3. But overall, it looks like the dynamic range is similar, but the R5C is better in the highlights and the FX3 is better in the shadows. So now we looked at a few examples. Let's verify this with the latitude or push-pull test and really get in there and take a look and see what's going on in the highlights and the shadows. So starting off by talking about the highlights, we'll do the overexposure test. And both cameras look pretty solid through three stops overexposed. There's a slight color change of four stops over on the FX3, but it still looks okay. And if five stops over, the FX3 looks pretty bad, the image breaks, but the R5C still looks pretty decent. So clearly there's a better highlight performance on the R5C, and this confirms what we're seeing with the real life examples. Looking at the shadows in the underexposure test, 
The R5C starts to change a little bit at even two stops underexposed. At three stops underexposed and further, the FX3 looks way better than the R5C. So like we saw with that indoor stress test, the FX3 performs better in the shadows than the R5C. Now overall, I'd say the dynamic range is pretty similar on these two cameras, which is a little bit surprising to me, but I have to give a slight advantage to the FX3 since the shadows were really bad on the R5C, and I think the difference in the shadow performance was more severe than the difference in the highlight performance. Now, I don't have a way to actually measure this because I don't have the tools to do that, so that's why I always look at real-life examples, push-pull tests, and the third way would be to actually measure it with, uh, with hardware and software, which I don't have access to that. Maybe someone else has tested the dynamic range on the XF ABC since the firmware update, but I'm not sure. Now, overall, this was really surprising to me in a lot of ways, but the biggest thing was the fact that when you're recording in XF ABC, you're recording in C-Log3 on the R5C, and this is not as good as C-Log2, but the R5C highlights looked really good, and I think overall the R5C dynamic range really hangs in there against the FX3. In terms of rolling shutter, the FX3 has a very fast sensor and performs better here, but the R5C really isn't that bad. I don't think it would be something you have to worry about too much on the R5C. Next, let's talk about battery life. And I know a lot of people have been critical about the R5C because of its poor battery performance, but they have updated the camera, like I said before, and increased the battery life as much as they possibly could. So let me give you some numbers. The R5C in its 8K RAW ST mode, I could get 60 minutes of nonstop recording. Of course, I had to reinitialize the card when it filled up. And the R5C in its power saving mode in the 4K XF AVC All I gave me one hour and 21 minutes. So they did our power saving mode, which helps out. They do limit some of the different settings in the camera, but an hour and 21 minutes of constant recording. Now the FX3 in the 4K XAVC SI, I got two hours and four minutes. So in straight battery performance, the FX3 does way better than the R5C, but they are also very different cameras, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But overall, in terms of internal battery life, huge advantage for the FX3. A big difference between these two cameras, of course, has to be the stabilization. Now the R5C does not have IBIS. It only has a digital image stabilization. There's two settings, on and high, whereas the FX3 has IBIS, a physical sensor shift stabilization that has two modes, the standard mode, which is just the IBIS, and the active mode is the IBIS plus a digital stabilization. Now for these tests, I actually use native lenses because I think it's important because a lot of the Canon RF lenses are image stabilized and that makes a big difference. I made a video detailing all the details about Canon stabilization of IBIS versus electronic stabe. And what I concluded from that is that the lens stabe is very important. So I'll leave that video linked down below. First off, let's start with a vlogging test. And this, I couldn't find exact comparable settings on both, but taking a look here, we had the standard stabilization versus the lens stabe on and the digital off. And then I compare this with the standard stabe against the lens stabe on and digital stabilization on in the R5C. And lastly, the active stabilization versus the lens stabe on and the digital setting on high. I have to say the active stabe looks pretty good here. And I think for the vlogging test, I'd probably give an advantage for the FX3 even with a non-stabilized lens. But your mileage may vary, and uh, you know I I'm not the best at handheld vlogging, but I just want to show you that. One thing that people are critical about the Canon IBIS system is the wobbles on the wide end, and of course you don't get that on the R5C because this doesn't have IBIS, so you're really relying on the lens stabilization and the digital stabilization in this camera. In terms of a static test, I did this at 50 millimeters of me just handholding the camera, and all of these combinations look pretty similar to me between these two cameras. So if you're trying to hold the camera to get a static shot at a wide or medium focal length. I think you can get pretty similar results between these two cameras. A lot of people were critical about the autofocus system in the R5C because when it came out, people were already familiar with the autofocus system that was in their mirrorless cameras like the R5, the R6. This runs on the cinema operating system, so it has the autofocus system of cameras like the C70. If I had to give an overall opinion about the two autofocus systems of the FX3 and the R5C, the autofocus is better on the FX3. It is faster to grab a subject, it's stickier, and I think it's a little bit more accurate. But there's some situations where the R5C, I think, shines. And the big thing for that is the face-only autofocus. If you don't know what this is, basically when you set to face-only, if it loses focus or if the uh, subject leaves the frame, it does not shoot to the background. I think this looks a lot more natural and you don't get any of that pulsing that can happen sometimes when it loses focus. So I think in general, if you are doing a lot of slow moving stuff, like you're doing interviews, talking heads, just more slower paced things, I really like the face only autofocus of the R5C. And I think you need to learn its 
you know, limitations of the autofocus system. But overall, I, the FX3 definitely has better autofocus. But again, the R5C is usable in some situations. You just have to, with every camera, learn its limitations and how you can use it. I do want to take a moment to talk about photography because both of these cameras do have a full frame sensor with a three by two ratio. Of course, you don't get open gate recording and video for either of them. Now, the biggest differences, of course, everyone's going to know about are the megapixels. The FX3 has 12.1 megapixels and the R5C has 45 megapixels. In addition to the increase in resolution, the big difference here is that the R5C, when you put it in photo mode, is a Canon R5. And at the time of recording this, is one of the best photography cameras on the market. So I don't want to take anything away from the FX3 because you can do a lot of really good photography with this for a lot of different situations than I have in the past. But this is a way more powerful and capable photography camera because it's a Canon R5 inside. So if you're doing some photography or you're doing some hybrid work or just someone like myself, where if I have this camera, I know I have crazy photography capabilities, I have to give a huge advantage for the R5C over the FX3. Next, let's talk about resolutions and frame rates. So the FX3, of course, can shoot up to 4K 120. Now, the 4K 120 has a 10% crop, which they do that so they get a one-to-one -one readout because normally it does a 4.2K oversample. So at 4K 120, you get a 10% crop. Now, the R5C can shoot 4K 120 at full width, and it can also shoot up to 8K 60. So if you're shooting in the 4K modes, you can get an 8.2K oversampled in 4K up to 60 frames per second. When you shoot 4K 120, you do get a line skipped or pixel bin mode. So they both shoot 4K 120. Of course, you get the 8K resolution up to 60 frames per second on the R5C. So a little bit of a difference there. In terms of codecs, the FX3 is a little bit more limited. For the internal codecs, you have three flavors of 4K. You have the XAVC SI, which is an all I H.264. XAVC-S, which is a long op H.264, and XAVC-HS, which is an H.265 codec. You can also record ProRes RAW externally to an NGV, and like I said before, I've made a few videos about that. Now, the R5C, you can shoot in 8K RAW in a few different flavors, LT, ST, and a few modes in HQ, and you can also record XAVC, XFAVC in all I or long op, and you also have the option of recording an MP4 in HEVC or H.264. A big difference between these two cameras are the crop modes that are available. So the FX3, because of its lower resolution, doesn't offer any crop modes when you're shooting in 4K. Of course, you can use clear image zoom, but you can't crop in on the sensor. Now the R5C, because it has so much resolution, offers a lot of different crop modes. You can shoot in Super 35 in a 6K60 RAW or up to 4K60. You can also shoot in Super 16 mode, which you can get a 3K60 RAW or 1080p60. So I really like the ability to have crop modes on my cameras. It's something I really wish the FX3 had, but it doesn't because of the lower resolution. Both cameras can import custom LUTs into them. The FX3 implementation is fantastic. The R5C, yes, you can do it, but there are some limitations. So it bakes it into the image when you're recording an XFABC. But if you wanna just look at the LUT as a preview LUT and record in RAW, it won't bake it in. So. Yes, there's custom LUT features on both cameras, but I just like the implementation better on the FX3. In terms of the mounts of these two cameras, of course, we have an E mount and an RF mount. I don't need to get into the differences with the two systems. Both are mirrorless mounts, and you can adapt pretty much whatever you want to them. So if you want to adapt EF lenses or PL lenses or using cinema lenses or vintage lenses or whatever, you can adapt them to either one. There's some, of course, differences with RF and E lenses. The E mount is open to third party, so there's a lot more options. And everyone's got preferences about, you know, Sony lenses versus Canon lenses, but both are mirrorless mounts and you can adapt a whole lot to them. So let's talk about the body design and ergonomics. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because most of you are probably familiar with this. So the big difference here is that the R5C has an EVF where the FX3 does not. And the FX3 is just a lot smaller of a camera, which is really handy in a lot of different situations. But I want to point out a couple things on the cameras. First of all, just looking at the tops of the cameras, they just look different. Mainly the FX3's got these quarter 20 mounting points. I thought this would be really cool, but um, you know, I don't really mount stuff to the camera. If I do want to mount stuff to the camera, I put a cage on it, but lots of buttons and dials. I think both ergonomics are pretty good and pretty easy to use, a lot of customizable buttons. I do want to talk about the ports on the camera for a second. So first of all, one big disadvantage for the R5C is that it has a micro HDMI port, whereas you have a full size HDMI port on the FX3. I know a lot of us are very familiar with this situation. You also have USB-C power delivery on both cameras, which is awesome to power the camera. The R5C, they did add a timecode port, which is really handy. You can do timecode on the FX3, but you have to get an adapter cable, so you just gotta be aware of that. 
Otherwise, all the same kind of ports on these cameras. They both have fans, which is fantastic because you don't have to worry about overheating. I'm a huge fan of fans. Onto the memory cards. Some differences here. The R5C uses a CF Express Type B card, which at the time of recording this is my favorite media because it's cheap, it's fast, and it's fairly reliable. The second card slot is an SD card, which is not my favorite media, but you know, the fact that you do have two slots, you can do dual recording in some modes, or you can do like raw on one and compressed codec on the other, or proxies. There's a lot of different options there. The Sony camera has the dual dual card slots, which they've been putting in all their cameras lately. They have their CF Express Type A cards and SD. You can put either one in either slot. So you have a lot of different options there. For me, I just generally wind up putting two CF Express Type A cards in there and dual record when I'm doing client work and stuff like that. Onto the backs of the cameras, obviously we have an EVF on the R5C, which I have to say is really handy in a lot of situations. Some people don't use it ever, but as time goes on, I'm, I am using it more often, especially when you're outside. I do want to point out something very different about these two cameras, and that's the screens. The FX3 LCD is absolutely terrible. It's small, it's not very bright, the resolution is really bad. I, I have to use a monitor pretty much all the time with this camera, and the fact that the FX3 does not have an EVF whatsoever when you're outside, sometimes you just can't see what you're doing unless you have a monitor. The R5C monitor is bigger, brighter, more colorful, easier to see. It's a huge advantage to me to have the LCD screen on the back. Now, in terms of audio, both of these cameras have a 3.5 mil jack on them, but you can get the um, the Tascam XLR unit for the R5C, and you can also put the included top handle on the FX to get XLR audio. So you do have options with that, but if you wanna run pretty minimal, then you can run 3.5 mil into both of them. One thing I do wanna point out about the R5C, which I love, is the fact that the shutter closes at shutdown. This is an awesome feature. I wish all cameras had that. I'm always nervous when I'm pulling my lens off outside, so it's a really nice feature to have. In terms of the menus and the usability of the cameras, they're very different. The FX3, in my opinion, is not as video focused as the R5C. The R5C runs on Canon's cinema operating system, which if you're not familiar with, is very different from the mirrorless system. I prefer it over the mirrorless system because it has a lot more cool things in it. I think the FX3 and the new Sony menus have come a long way with their new main menus. I think they're really easy to work, but this is really more video focused. And because of that operating system, you get things that you don't get in the FX3. The biggest ones being shutter angle, waveform, and false color. I do not understand why the FX3 does not have shutter angle. This camera is labeled a cinema camera and there's a lot of different debate, there's a lot of debate out there about what is a cinema camera, what is not. But I think shutter angle is one of those things that seems little at first, but after you use cameras more and more for shooting video, it becomes more of a big deal. And the, the shutter angle or shutter speed is not an exposure tool as a videographer, it's set. So that I really wish they would put that in this camera. Of course, that is in the R5C. Having better exposure tools like waveform and false color are awesome to have in the R5C. I just hit a button, I can check my false color. The only exposure tool you get in the camera of the FX3 is the histogram, which is basically a photography tool. Of course, you can use an external monitor to have all these things, but a lot of the reasons that people are using these cameras is that you can strip them down, use them as small mirrorless hybrid cameras, and to have a button that I programmed to hit and do, put false color on, shutter angle, waveform, all those kinds of things. Anyways, I don't wanna harp on it too much, but I would love to see the FX3, I know it's not gonna happen with a firmware update, but future iterations of this to have a video focused menu, like the R5C, one of the coolest things I think about when they designed this camera is this switch here, because when you switch this over to photo, it acts as a Canon R5, which is a photo camera, and we switch over to video, you get a full on cinema experience. So if you are watching this to try to make a purchase decision between these two cameras, let me give you some pricing and my recommendations. Now, the FX3 launched at $3,900. It has never gone on sale. The price has never increased or decreased. It's always been $3,900. The R5C price has been all over the place. It launched at $4,500. It went up to $4,800. I think the retail price is $4,300 right now, but it's currently on sale for the holidays right now at the end of 2023 for $3,400 here in the United States. Of course, the FX3 does come with the XLR top handle, so if you need the XLR Tascam unit, that is an additional cost you'd have to factor in for the R5C. Now, I get a lot of people asking me about recommendations when they're trying to decide between cameras, and both of these cameras are just absolutely incredible cameras. They're very powerful, they produce insanely good images, 
both for professional use and hobby use. You're not gonna be disappointed with either of these cameras. The bigger question that you have to ask yourself is ecosystem and lenses. Now, the thing that I like to think about first when I'm trying to decide between cameras is what lenses you need to do the work that you need to do, and then that will kind of steer you in the direction of which system that you wanna be in and which system you wanna invest in. Also think about other people that you shoot with, what kind of cameras they shoot with so you can share equipment and you can also shoot together and cut footage really easily and those sorts of things. So it's not just the cameras, you really have to think about the ecosystem and the other cameras and lenses and stuff that you own. If you are doing any photography whatsoever, the R5C brings a lot more value because like I said before, it has a Canon R5 inside. Now, why would you wanna choose the FX3 over the R5C? I think the big selling points for the FX3 are gonna be the size, it's a lot smaller, the battery life is way better, and you get better autofocus and you also get IBIS. Now the R5C gives you a lot more power for video. You get 8K raw video up to 60 frames a second, you get all those crop modes, you get all those video tools. I do feel like it's more of a cinema camera with its operating system and the exposure tools, shutter angle, all that kind of stuff. You also get an EVF and better LCD on the R5C. So there are pros and cons to both of this and I just really wanna take a deep dive and see how they stacked up to, up to each other in terms of their technical capabilities. If you enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe. It would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.